prime time hearing of the House Select Committee probing the January 6 Capitol attack presented gut-wrenching footage of that day. A case has been built that the attack was a planned coup fomented by former US President Donald Trump. So where is this investigation headed? Hello and welcome to this special broadcast of the We on VOA co-production. I'm Priyanka Sharma. On the show today, we'll tell you about where these hearings are headed and what lies ahead. So let's get started. To reveal the outlines of a conspiracy. To prevent the peaceful transfer of power in the United States after the 2020 presidential election. That is the goal of a televised series of public hearings which began on Thursday night in the U.S. Congress. The Congressional Committee hired a veteran TV executive to help tell the story of what its investigation shows led to the violent attack of the Capitol, January 6, 2021. Members have interviewed more than 1,000 witnesses. During Thursday night's presentation, we heard from a British documentarian who was embedded with a far-right group accused of conspiring to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. We also heard from one of the first Capitol Hill police officers to respond to the attack and get injured on the job. The leaders of the Congressional Committee made it clear on Thursday that the evidence they have uncovered puts the blame for the violence of the January 6 attack on provocative statements and tweets from former U.S. President Donald Trump. January 6 was the culmination of an attempted coup, a brazen attempt, as one rioter put it shortly after January 6, to overthrow the government. The violence was no accident. It represents Senate Trump's last stand, most desperate chance to halt the transfer of power. On this point, there is no room for debate. Those who invaded our Capitol and battled law enforcement for hours were motivated by what President Trump had told them, that the election was stolen and that he was the rightful president. President Trump summoned the mob assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. And joining us now with more analysis is VOA correspondent Jessica Stone from Washington, D.C. Jessica, thanks for joining us. My first question for you, what are the political implications for the upcoming congressional elections of this news development? Well, this investigative committee is made up mostly of Democrats, and part of that is because Republicans refused to join the committee. But there are two of them on the committee. You just heard from Liz Cheney, a Republican of Wyoming. Uh, she is the one who's essentially the most vulnerable because her primary opponent in the upcoming fall election is backed by Donald Trump, and she has taken a very firm stance, as you saw in that clip, against the idea that the election of 2020 was in any way rigged or falsified or fraudulent. Um, and her opponent, as I said, does have the primary backing and endorsement of former President Donald Trump. Uh, what's also clear is that many Republicans uh, who are in the minority in the House of Representatives have continued to back the former U.S. president in that claim. And so uh, the question really is, will anything from these uh, six or seven hearings give the electorate enough evidence to uh, not elect or give them the majority in the fall? Uh, and there's certainly a lot of uh, momentum against the Democrats with respect to inflation and high gas prices. Many Republicans uh, are still vulnerable, though, on that cause of what how, how they supported the the president. It's, it's unclear, though, whether or not uh, we'll have a, an overturn of the uh, of, of folks like Liz Cheney um, uh, coming up in, in the fall elections, because according to some polls, roughly one third of Americans are still supportive, still believe that the election right. was stolen in 2020. Bianca? Right. In fact, Jessica, we saw some gut wrenching footage of that day in the televised hearing. I think what everybody wants to know at this point is what's the next step in this investigation? Well, we're going to see two more hearings next week, one on Monday, one on Wednesday. We'll uh, likely see and hear from many, many more witnesses. We're likely to see much more uh, footage of the kind that we saw on uh, Thursday night. And as you said, it was gut-wrenching. It's very, uh, very helpful in terms of making the case that the investigative committee is attempting to make. We're likely to see more from Jared Kushner, uh, the uh, husband of uh, Ivanka Trump, the daughter of the U.S. president, who said on Thursday night that she uh, did take 
at face value the, the, uh, the assessment by the former attorney general, uh, Bill Barr, that this was not a fraudulent election. So we can tell you that people around the U.S. president did not believe it was fraudulent either. Uh, meantime, the Department of Justice is prosecuting the criminal cases against the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers. These are the far right groups who have been accused of seditious conspiracy. Uh, and we'll have to see if what this culminates in is a recommendation by this investi investigative committee that the Department of Justice prosecute the former U.S. president. That would be unprecedented. Right, absolutely. Jessica, thanks for those inputs. Stay with us on this special broadcast. We'll come back to you for your inputs on another story. Let's move on now. The U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met his Chinese counterpart at a defense forum in Singapore recently. The meeting is a rare face-to-face -face encounter between senior U.S. and Chinese officials. The two sides may not find much common ground amid fraying relations. As VOA's Bill Gallo reports from Seoul, South Korea. Take a look. the latest sign of U.S.-China tensions. These Chinese and Russian military planes flew late last month near U.S. Asian allies' airspace. While U.S. President Joe Biden was on an Asia trip aimed at countering Beijing. Russia's war in Ukraine has only deepened the U.S.-China divide. Although China has not openly supported Russia's war, it has pledged closer ties, worrying many in Washington. It's identifying with, with a very aggressive country, uh, and the United States worries that that's the way China wants to approach the, the uh, situation in Taiwan as well, use brute force to achieve its objectives. China views democratic Taiwan as part of its own territory. It threatens to take it by force. A lot of it depends Biden has promised the United States would defend Taiwan if China invades, raising fears of a superpower conflict. Although analysts say the meeting is unlikely to result in any progress. The uh, Taiwan issue is possibly uh, the issue where there's greatest divergence between the two superpower. The United States and China have both increased their shows of military might in the region surrounding Taiwan. Many other countries fear they could be drawn into major conflict. Most uh, in the region prefer uh, to have incremental steps in tuning down the temperature, knowing that it is not possible to resolve uh, such a complicated issue, at least find some common points where they can uh, sort of make the atmosphere uh, much more, uh, you know, conducive uh, for talks. There are possible areas of U.S.-China cooperation, including climate change and the North Korean nuclear issue. But with ties in their current state, the space for working together may be small. Bill Gallo, VOA News, Seoul, South Korea. <music> And we still have VOA's correspondent Jessica Stone with us on this broadcast live from Washington. Jessica, now two top U.S. diplomats are touring Asia this week. What's the goal of these visits and how do they fit into this competition between Washington and Beijing in the region? Well, we do have those two diplomats, the state counselor, uh, Derek Gillette, and assistant secretary of state, Wendy Sherman. She met with her counterparts in Japan and Korea, uh, focused specifically on the North Korea uh, nuclear issue, uh, preparing for what could be the fifth test by Pyongyang of a nuclear miss a powered missile. They committed to extending deterrence and to working more closely together. That obviously has implications because there have been fraught relations between Tokyo and Seoul in that respect. Uh, Secretary Sherman also meeting with Ferdinand Marcos, the incoming president of the Philippines, and she's also expected to go to Laos and uh, to, uh, to Vietnam. Uh, that second top diplomat also in the region meeting with three Southeast Asian uh, countries on the agenda, finding a path forward on Myanmar, uh, reinforcing the U.S. commitment to the region, especially not just on uh, countering China, but on deepening economic engagement, because, of course, the U.S. will be leading the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Initiative in the new year. Uh, really, U.S. officials want to draw a contrast uh, with Russia and with China, arguing that these are countries that want to rewrite the world order and warning that a lack of balance in the region will lead to regional conflict and 
instability. Bianca. Right, Jessica. Finally, one area of great concern, of course, for Washington is this naval base in Cambodia where the Chinese are making upgrades. But what are the Chinese working on there and should Washington be concerned? Well, the, Beijing actually cut, uh, broke ground, I should say, uh, on that facility on Wednesday. There was a, a ribbon cutting ceremony and a tour. We've got some pictures of that. Beijing has pledged to build uh, a dry dock for ship repairs, a pier, a hospital, a reception area, a workshop. Uh, and in 2019, the Wall Street Journal reported that there was a secret deal between the Cambodians and the Chinese to give basing rights or exclusive access to the Chinese military. The Chinese and Cambodians have consistently refuted those claims that Washington's key fear is that this essentially will become the second external base for the Chinese military. You'll, you'll recall they are building one in Djibouti uh, in the Horn of Africa as well. Uh, this would, of course, allow the Chinese military to project way more power into the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and this has great implications for regional stability. As I said earlier, the American embassy in Phnom Penh has actually said that this could also impact Cambodian sovereignty and regional stability. But as you know, Washington has little leverage over Cambodia these days, and the Cambodian government's relationship with China is far closer than it is with the U.S. government. Right, Jessica Stone, thanks so much for joining us on this special broadcast. Thanks for all your inputs.